Write out your questions and the cards will be collected. The questions will be reviewed. They should be addressed to the particular often a registered voter and a resident of the city for at least one year prior to taking office. The mayor's powers and duty. Mr. Platt. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to everyone who is a part of this and all of you here. Uh, a little bit of myself, I am 29 years old and I've lived in my whole life. I've been aware of environmental issues since I was a toddler because my father was part of the movement to save pine bush. And it would not have existed as it is today as a preserve without the hard work and dedication and sacrifices of activists. If left up to the market or uh, government regulation at the time, it would have been completely uh, consumed by sprawl. Uh, fast forward, I joined the Occupy movement in college because I seek uh, alternatives to the institutions of the 20th century that have not been delivering on environmentalism because uh, an age of environmentalism, that, in the age of adaptation that we are in when it comes to adapting to climate change that we need for the 21st century, uh, we need new institutions to do that. So from the Occupy movement, from a desire to understand how things work, and to look for solutions. I, as a representative of the Green Party, represent those solutions and the kind of organization and the way of doing things that we need uh, in the future and today. A need to transform our economy, to look at the very base reasons why our economy is very, makes it very difficult to even be environmental. Any company that tries to be environmental usually doesn't survive. And trying to present environmental disasters is usually, is always a defensive battle. We need to have those defensive battles and go on the offense when possible. Thank you. We will ask the first question, which will be answered first by Mr. Platt. The actions, decisions, budgets, and priorities of your administration represent the city's values not only to residents, but to other communities. How would you incorporate environmental protection, stewardship, and justice into the daily operations of your administration? But first, I'll talk about that question by relating it to how, when it comes to land management, open space policy, waste, water, uh, these things have to be done on a regional level because our streams, our rivers, and land management isn't just um, between our borders. Now, if we look internally to city policy, that is a matter of kind of giving every city employee a crash course in sustainable infrastructure and whatnot. I, myself, have gone through the long version of that through architecture school. My background is urban design and architecture, and I have lived um, and breathe the kind of policy solutions and alternatives to being actually sustainable and resilient. And it takes a lot of work and resources, and those are resources that need to be made accessible, not only to employees, but neighborhoods and households. Access to resources is a theme of mine, because all the opportunities in the world don't mean anything if you don't have the resources. Thank you. Mr. Platt. So I'm very well acquainted with the uh, concept of intersectional thinking, which is that pollution hits the poorest hardest, and the poorest are usually the darkest skin. Um, if businesses don't have to pay for pollution, usually they're regulated into uh, preventing some of it, but otherwise they can still dump with impunity. So we need to put a cost on pollution, however, whatever tactic we use, and that's an open debate to have. We need to put a cost on it. And whatever's collected from that needs to go to our poorest and darkest communities in the form of creating green districts because a lot of those plans and projects are already on the shelf, they're on paper. They just need the resources and the funding stream to do that. Aside from that, there's also the need for participatory government and decision making. It is a value and principle of mine that those affected by decisions need proportional power in making that decision as participatory government. Thank you. Dan? No? Okay. Yeah. Now we're back to... No, no, no. Dan. Yeah, Dan Platt. I apologize. So, first of all,
first and foremost, um, the need for soft infrastructure, because nothing cleans better than natural nature, is made clear by those responses. There needs to be a source of funding for all of this, a source of funding that is under our control. So a direct action I would take is to advocate and create municipal bank, because I'm a proponent of municipal banking. That's a bank that we are in control of, so we can create the funds, along with a uh, regional sense, for soft infrastructure. Um, along with that, I would take care of, I would promote initiatives for depaving, um, lawn aside, putting aside 10% of the lawn because if you let it grow wild, that retains more water as well as all the other soft infrastructure that's landscaping and that's all these kinds of, uh, as a designer, I am trained to make no, no, no other way except the impacts of water and land and all that stuff. Thank you. The next, we're going to move on to the energy efficiency fossil fuels portion of our debate. Uh, many cities are leading the way when it comes to climate action, energy efficiency, and moving their communities away from fossil fuels. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, for instance, recently announced it would no longer build a new parking garage downtown, instead provide passes for public transportation to those who work in the area. Many communities are strengthening their building codes to ensure new construction includes solar panels and things like that. What specific actions will you take in the upcoming term to make Albany a leader on climate action and energy efficiency? And we'll begin with Dan Platt. All right, so we finished updating our zoning code. Now we need to work on the building code, um, as well as going full bore on the 2030 plan. I believe that the progress we've made based on the 2030 plan has been at a crawl, and there's still a lot of unchecked things that haven't even been started yet. Thank you. Uh, again, the question is, what specific actions will you take in the upcoming term to make Albany a leader on climate action and energy efficiency? Kathy Sheehan. The question again is, what carbon reduction accomplishments would you focus on in year one of the next mayoral term? And uh, our final candidate to answer that question is Dan Platt, who is also um, is also using his red card. Yeah. So you have two minutes. Right. So I'll use the first minute to talk energy, because there's so many options. But um, so first, uh, energy, I would seek a community aggregate energy agreement. This is where we negotiate a fixed low energy price with a renew renewable provider of the whole city. People are free to opt out, but otherwise it will lower everyone's bill. And just like with pharmaceutical companies, we can get a lower price that we're in control of, not national grid. Uh, the other side of that, of course, is the reason why national grid prices are sometimes high is because the power is traveling over long distances and 40% of all energy created is lost over transmission. Believe it. Um, so we need a local public power authority to then build the community energy projects that we need on the community scale uh, to supplement that, along with going back to the building codes to make them net zero as possible. And that needs to be the goal, net zero, which is 70% insulation, 30% energy, that's really what it takes. So the other half, talk about transportation. Um, want to remunicipalize or make as public as possible the parking agency we have as a step towards uh, congestion pricing, also known as a commuter tax, however you want to, whatever tax you want to take to make sure that those that are commuting in by car, especially alone, are paying some cost to the city so we can develop our own uh, better mass transit network, particularly a uh, network of vans or mini buses that can loop around neighborhoods to fill the gaps of the CTA. CTA is a great network and I use it daily to commute myself, but there are still many neighborhoods that are unreached. The other half of that, of course, is biking, and I'm an avid biker, and that means uh, putting in the money, putting in the development on major avenues, and having that general educational approach for the rest, because streets belong to everyone. Thank you. The next Next question. Governor Cuomo has made a pledge to get up to 1 million zero emission electric vehicles on the road by 2025. And in order to meet the state's commitment to 100% clean energy by 2050, that means no more fossil fuel vehicles can be sold 
after 2035. Please describe your vision for making Albany a leader when it comes to electric vehicles and EV infrastructure. And we're going to begin with Dan Platt. So I'll be very honest that uh, promoting EV and vehicles in general is not high priority for me because a car, no matter even if all this electricity is coming from renewables, is still a car, very inefficient to move to one or two tons to move 200 pounds. Uh, there are better ways of doing that, as well as all the infrastructure needed to support our car-based cities, which separate us and uh, individually and collectively. So I wouldn't take any personal action, but if people come to me with proposals, I will not stand in the Thank you. Dan Platt. I want to expand on my uh, first comment that I'm not like anti-car, it's about not designing our cities around the dependence on them. So to that effect, um, the first part, as soon as possible, obviously. Uh, when it's physically possible, I don't mean financially, because there are line items in the budget that get dedicated to vehicle placement and repair to convert vehicles to uh, whatever uh, biofuel is available, especially when it comes to uh, securing a source. So biodiesel is a thing. And, and for vehicles that where it's not feasible to go electric, uh, which is obviously the case, uh, emergency vehicles, go biodiesel, um, and other such fuels made from organics, thus the need for that trash plan to include them. Thank you. The future here in Albany. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Platt, same question. Reduction is all about going upstream on the supply chain. So a direct answer uh, policy is a plastic bag ban. Uh, these are urban tumbleweeds. I pick one up on average every day as I walk around. Um, reducing our waste is also not a problem to be individualized because most of it, when it comes to packaging and how things are made, that is upstream. So it is not quite city policy, but I would encourage and facilitate the creation of a consumer union. Individually, as consumers, our dollars are weak. Voting with a dollar is not really powerful. But real political empowerment when it comes to this issue comes in consumers banding together and demanding better for the retailers that serve. Again, the question is, what is your vision for waste reduction in Albany? Um, Dan Platt has wielded his red card, so you get one minute. All right, so I just want to make a general point about when we uh, experiment with policies that they be uh, very uh, conducted in a scientific way, that there's double blinds or at least we test for individual things so we know what causes what results. <coughs> And uh, as well as our educational <coughs> engagement to never be half hearted as it has been historically. The other point I want to make is um, not to criticize the um, recycling program in the, in the way McLaughlin spoke, but I want to point out that the people currently banking on re um, recycling bottles and cans in public uh, spaces is the homeless, and sometimes it's to the point where they're fighting over them uh, because that is a fact that the homeless. <coughs> One of the only sources of income they have, um, as well as actual employment, as you know, they're spending hours a day working to do this. So, uh, unless there are resources in place to make sure that they have a floor. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn McLaughlin has wielded her red card. I'm going to work backwards. Um, the last issue that Mr. Platt made about the, just the homeless recycling bottles and cans, not so. Um, I guess if I asked people to raise their hands in here, they would also say that um, if you're recycling at home and you're bringing in these items into your home, you're recycling them as well. You're collecting them yourself. We often say that my, uh, one man's uh, trash is another man's treasure, but I really do believe we have to get people to thinking that your trash is your treasure and you're going to make better decisions on what you bring into your house. Because, and then when you do that, you'll have a better um, output of what you're taking out to the curb. And I do believe when I'm talking about curbside um, composting, 
There are many organizations, universities around this country that are composting their waste and, and turning it into revenue um, for their organizations. Their um, cafeteria leaders are doing that, so Thank you. Um, I don't think this is a haphazard idea. We now have a series of yes or no questions that we're going to begin uh, asking uh, Dan Platt. Yes or no. Do you support closure of the Rack Road landfill and proposed transfer station, which would lead to the city's waste ending up in western New York or another state? No, the transfer station. Kathy Sheehan, same question. That's an incorrect characterization of what is being proposed. Uh, this is not a yes or no question. Uh, how would you expand the placement of solar-powered waste receptacles throughout the city? And we're going to go to Dan Platt first. I suppose this goes under the rubric of creating municipal banking so we can afford the infrastructure we desperately need. Uh, so I'll expand on why a public bank is so important. When we take a bond out or any kind of loan from other banks in Wall Street, they charge us high interest. We're practically paying 50% more for everything we build. With municipal banking, we can reduce that to a minuscule amount of interest, perhaps even not. Um, and this, of course, would be a source of financing for everyone uh, for their own renewable slash sustainability projects. Thank you. Kat Thank you. Next question. This is about the Port of Albany. Due to the grassroots advocacy of people in the community, particularly as for apprentice residents, the state has reversed course on approval of an oil heating facility at the port, as well as air quality monitoring in the South End. However, the gas and oil industry continues to view Albany as a global transshipment hub for their product as it makes its way to the global market. What is your vision for the future of the Port of Albany? And do you believe Albany should continue to serve the industry in this way? And we begin with Kathy Sheehan. Dan Platt. First, I'm say um, I'm proud to be part of the efforts to block that and all the other efforts of little partners and etc. Uh, this is a case of solidarity that is very important. Second, uh, as a choke point that puts us in a great strength of uh, placement of power. Uh, and it is my priority uh, under the thinking that any fossil fuel infrastructure that is built is the promise to use more of it. It doesn't matter where it's used, it's still a disaster. So we need to block it as much as um, at no fossil fuel infrastructure period. Um, and this also speaks to the um, reality that market and city mechanisms usually can't handle the bigger problems of waste and energy and its use because this is a problem of our general economy. The very fact that these companies have kept the truth of their monstrous policies when it comes to even the creation of the situation we're in. Thank you. We're going to go to some questions from the audience now. And we're going to begin with Dan Platt. What is your position on anaerobic digestion, and what role would it play in your waste management plan? I've actually studied this in college as part of my coursework. The anaerobic digestion can be done on a small scale, as small as even your own stove, uh, to as big as a citywide um, tank, you know, industrial tank that creates uh, biogas generation. So. It would factor in very heavily uh, on every scale, in schools, citywide, and that is, of course, all part of the building code. And plan. So, um, grids are good. Natural gas burning is bad. Uh, for the record, this is my neighborhood. And I, since this still is in the planning stage, then we need to push the state hard to look into geothermal as well as geothermal will put into the building codes. This is where you go underground, it's always cooler underground or warmer depending on what season it is. Um, a comment about, so and if they say no because they're a big uh, state government, they don't have to listen to us as is usually the case, um, we should push then for them to pay a much smaller amount likely 
for uh, turning Sheridan Hollow into the Green District. During the renewal, uh, there was a lot of ideas, but also a lot of disappointments um, as far as local residents like myself are concerned. Thank you. This is the thank you, Dan Platt. So this kind of issue kind of goes to the one of the paradoxes of our economy and how it works. That uh, the city needs the tax revenues from the port. The port is doing well because of the importation, transit of fossil fuels, which they damage. And we know the air is damaging. Uh, most of what the state's doing is a mere technicality to prove it. Uh, otherwise, what can be done is to invest in the soft infrastructure. Any air pollution can be mitigated by putting more greenery in. And that's a lot cheaper, as well as, of course, reducing the amount of actual traffic and pollution happening. And that is a long process, uh, but it's one that we can start immediately, and then no one have, ever has to move. No one has to be relocated. We can stop the cycle of structural violence that permeates our society. Thank you. Captain Dan Platt. First, I want to say if you like uh, to see me or Brian go deeper into these project uh, ideas, we're going to have our Green Party debate tomorrow at the Social Justice Center at 6. Uh, we did not talk about food and food policy today. Uh, I have a agenda to end food deserts and whatnot. I am a designer, an architectural designer, but a designer nonetheless, trained to think ecologically and also in terms of social ecology, thinking about our built environment. Are there civic spaces? Are there spaces for art and creativity? Are people allowed to do things? This is general thinking about how, what the function of government is, that it is a facilitator of access and not a micromanager, and as well as carrying on about the collective solutions and the collective politics and not putting it on individuals or just leaving it up to individual responsibility. This is something to keep in mind, but they need to be taken together. Thank you.